three ninety. Let's get a hymn this morning and turn to hymn number 390. Hymn number 390. Let's sing. Stand. couple verses of Exodus this morning. had uh, sort of two things that stood out to me. But there in Exodus, reading about the ephod, it said, And they shall make the ephod of gold, of blue, and of purple, and scarlet, and fine twine linen with cunning work. They shall have two shoulder pieces thereof, joined at the two edges thereof, and so it shall be joined together. And the curious girdle of the ephod, which is upon it, shall be of the same, according to the work thereof, even of gold, of blue, and purple, and scarlet, fine twine linen. And thou shalt take the two onyx stones, and grave on them the names of the children of Israel, six their names on the stone, on the one stone, and the other six names of the rest on the other stone, according to their birth, with the work of an engraver in stone, like the engravings, of a signet. Thou shalt engrave the two stones with the names of the children of Israel, and thou shalt make them to be set in ouches of gold. And thou shalt put the two stones upon the shoulders of the ephod for the stones of memorial uh, unto the children of Israel. And Aaron shall bear their names before the Lord upon his two shoulders for a memorial. Thou shalt take, or thou shalt make ouches of gold and two chains of pure gold at the ends of wreath and work, and shalt make them 
and fasten them, or the wreath and chains, to the ashes. And so in this, there was two thoughts that jumped out to me. One was the curious nature and the cunning work that was to be used in making these garments. And the second thing was these two stones. And uh, what I've seen in it was, I think we can see a picture of Christ in this ephod. And uh, of course we know that uh, a lot of this uh, in the tabernacle was to point us to Christ and uh, to see him. But the cunning work and the curious nature of the girdle and the cunning work of the ephod itself made of the, the fine linens. And I thought about how we can see a picture of the, the incarnation. How we can see a picture of a, of a curious work, of a cunning work that God did when his son came down from heaven and took on flesh to be the high priest over his people. As he came to, to earth and he lived according to the law of God and he uh, fulfilled the law of God that he might obtain for his people perfect righteousness. And then how the second part of it, how we see the grave, the graven stones. And these two onyx stones that just jumped out at me, they were to be engraven with the names of his people. And we see over in John 17 how that Jesus had knew about a people that would believe at the preaching of the, uh, the apostles word and he prayed there not for the world but he prayed for those whom the father had given him and how the Lord had carried us on his shoulders as he went through the the garden as he walked through this life he carried his people upon his shoulders Isaiah told us that the government shall be upon his shoulders Daniel we read about a kingdom that was given him that would contain all nations and tribes and and tongues and of, of people and in Revelations, we see that that people will ultimately be in heaven due to the, the work of Christ and through faith in Christ have we been justified before God. But I thought about also how Jesus taught us the, the parable of the sheep and how when he saves a sinner, how he brings him home victoriously on his shoulders. And then it said here that this was to be a memorial. These stones were to be a memorial for the children of Israel. And I thought about how today we can look back. Romans 5, 8 tells us that God commended his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And how we can look back at how he bore our sins and, and carried our sorrows and how he was put to grief and how he uh, uh, perfectly made that atonement for us. And how we can look back to that as a memorial. And I noticed, you know, it said to the children of Israel. It's for his people to look back to. Remember that we don't carry ourselves, but that we're carried on his shoulders, and that our great high priest ever liveth to make intercession for us. But in this uh, picture, the last thing was the gold. It had the two chains, it had the chains of gold put at the ends out of the wreath and work. And I love how the, the gold was included, because when I read and understood that there's lesser priests and then there's the high priest, and what I understood was that the, the lesser priest carried these onyx stones also, but they didn't wear a golden girdle. So as far as the high priest goes, there's that side of it. But the, the last application I want to make for us also out of this is, is that the onyx stones were on the regular priest also. And so I see a responsibility, a responsibility for us as his people to be that nation, that kingdom of priests that he's saved us to be. And we need to use this open opportunity that he's given us to pray and we need to use this opportunity he's given us to preach and we need to use this opportunity he's given us to to work out our salvation in this world that we may shine as lights in this world and that we may uh, be salt in this world and the priests were to, were to make the the scriptures known to people the priests were to make uh, to do the work in the temple of, of maintaining the temple the priests were to be um, uh, between God and, and the people. And I thought about how us today, how we need to, to live up to that, that calling, to be like a priest, because we have access to be able to pray to God. We have access to, to be able to know his word and to teach it to others. And we need to take seriously that responsibility in our daily lives and in our circles and as we get opportunity with folks to take seriously that responsibility to be a light in this world and to be an intercessor and to, to pray for one another. But uh, 
that's about all I've got this morning. Uh, I hope it was a help. Uh, uh, encouraged me a little bit. And uh, if anybody's got a prayer request, uh, we'll have that now. <coughs> well, the title of our lesson is Set Apart in the Way We Live. <clears throat> you know, as a, as a Christian, we walk with Christ in truth and love. You know, I said, I've said this uh, before, and, uh, you know, I can talk to a complete stranger, never met him, talk to him for five minutes, and usually you can tell if that person is a Christian. Is a Christian, we're set apart. And we're different than the world. <clears throat> you know, Seth, he, uh, I was talking to Seth, and he got me watching. Annette and I, we was watching it. It's, a, it's an eight-part series, about 40-some minutes or so for each part. <clears throat> it was on Netflix, and it was called Quarterback. It, uh, it was about three different quarterbacks in the NFL. Last year, uh, they followed the, these three quarterbacks all year long before the season got started, and, and then it went all the way till after the season was over. You know, and it was amazing. It's very interesting. It was amazing all that they do to prepare for a game. You know, all the personal trainers, chiropractors and everything else, all the workouts they do, learning the playbook and, and how to call each play. You know, one play may be called Zebra 44, Hiccup 343, George Bush on two. <laughs> well, each part, each part of that tells each player what they're to do for that call or for that play. And the quarterback has to know exactly what each player on that field is doing. Anyway, the camera, it was in the locker room with them. It was in their car, car with them. It was in their home with them, with their families. But one quarterback stood apart from the other two you could tell pretty quick that he was a Christian. He was set apart. He was very competitive, but you never heard him say anything bad, anything wrong. He was always, he always seemed to be happy, and he was a great leader. He was always thinking, always thinking about others instead of himself, especially when it came to his family. His wife, she was very supportive, and you could tell she had a sweet spirit. She loved Jesus. I could, on, I could just go on and on describing him, but you probably get the picture here. His name was Kurt Cousins, the quarterback for the Minnesota Vikings. Great role model for people to see. At the end of the show, he had just got beat last year in the playoffs. And of course, he, he was disappointed, but he was still smiling. He did get the Bart Starr Award, which is given to someone for their integrity on and off the field. But at the end of the show, he was putting his seven-year-old son to bed. And he first, he sung. I mean, this is the night just after he got beat. He sung him a song and then he prayed. He sung, on Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. And then he prayed in Jesus' name. Anyway, from now on, I'm pulling for him when he, when he plays. He's set apart 
in the way he lived. He loves Jesus, and he lived that way. You know, the world does not like Christians. They see us as a bunch of hypocrites, judgmental, and, you know, judgmental when we don't agree with them. You know, they see us as a bunch of haters because we don't love their evil ways. But our lifestyle is love and truth because we're set apart in Christ. They just don't want to see it in our love. You know, I'm sure the non-believers seeing Kirk Cousins, this, this show, paid more attention to his stats instead of seeing Jesus in him. You know, in, in our lesson, it's taken from 2 John, and he, he was writing to the church, commending them for their love for one another. And we'll get started here reading here in verse 1. The elder unto the elect lady and her children, whom I, whom I love in the truth, and not I only, but also all they that have known the truth. You know, John may have wrote this letter to a Christian mother and her family, but more than likely he wrote this letter to the church. John, at this time, he was getting older. He was getting up in years, and he refers to himself as the elder. The elect lady in this verse is probably referring to the church and the children as the members of the church. You know, one reason John may have addressed this letter was to disguise who he was writing to. At this time, the, the Roman Empire was really persecuting Christians, so John was probably trying to protect the church. But John says he loves this church in the truth. The church knew God was true. They knew Jesus was real and was the truth. So John wanted the church to love God's truths and love one another more and more. You know, the love of the truth is found in the gospel message and there's no greater love shown than the love of God through Jesus Christ for each one of us. No greater love. John says that he loved them, but he was not the only one that loved them. He says that they that have known the truth loves this church. The church, it must have been well known for being faithful to God. You know, there was a, they were being a, a, a great example for the other churches. The church and its members were doing what God wanted them to do. In verse 2, For the true sake which dwelleth in us and shall be with us forever. Truth. <laughs> truth is so important. And the truth is what causes John, what's caused John to love this church so much. The church and its members, they lived in the truth. Jesus, he dwelt in these believers. You know, when a person is saved, Jesus will never leave us. He's always with us, all the way for eternity. You know, this church... It was built on the foundation of Jesus, on the truth of the foundation of Jesus. It's, it, empowered, it, it empowered them to love and to live for Jesus. You know, our faith in Jesus is what binds Christians together. It binds us together. You know, I have never met <clears throat> Kirk Cousins, never met him, Really never knew him. I knew he was a quarterback. But when I was watching that, I felt a love for him because he is my brother in Christ. <clears throat> it binds us together. Verse 3, Grace be with you, mercy and peace from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father, in truth and love. 
Grace means goodwill from God. You know, if, if we were writing a letter or email to someone, it would, you know, it would be like us saying, I hope you're doing well or trust that, that uh, you and your family is in, are in good health. In this letter, John wished God's goodness and favor on the people he was writing to. Mercy here is God's pity on us but also his kindness to us. God rescued us from our sins and also certain death. You know, John wanted to remind his readers to always, we, we need to always remember the experience of God's uh, mercy in salvation. We need to remember that. God's grace that we have received is, is a total undeserved gift of eternal life with him. You know, my book here, it gives a, a, pretty, a, a kind of a pretty good example of this. If you get pulled over by, the, by a policeman for speeding, and he doesn't give you a ticket for it, the policeman is giving you mercy, which Annette has experienced. <laughs> But if this same policeman gives you $50 also for speeding, that is grace. We don't deserve money for breaking the law. We don't deserve eternal life for sinning. We need to praise God. Praise God every day for His mercy and His grace. You know, John tells his readers that grace and, and mercy and peace only comes from God, God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father. No one can find this in the world. If they do, it sure is not going to last. John says to remain, to remain in the truth and love that is only found in God. In verse 4, I rejoice greatly that I found of thy children walking in truth as we have received a commandment from the Father. So John, he says, he rejoiced greatly because of this church. The church members, they were walking the walk and they talked the talk of the truth. When he, said, I, when, he, were, when he said, I found of thy children walking in truth, truth, this is not, or this is me, not everyone though was walking in truth. Walking is referring to our daily lives. You know, they, uh, some people may be, they may say one thing, but their lives they were living was saying another. John says, John says that Christians should live their lives according to, to the truth is we have received commandment from the Father. Is the song that we just sung this morning, which I know Gary, he's teaching, so he knows <laughs> he picked this song out. But as the song says, trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. <clears throat> Now, when you talk to a complete stranger, like I said, you can a lot of times tell if they're a Christian or not. Because a Christian, a lot, most of the time, unless they're just having a terrible, terrible bad day, but Christians, they're happy. We're content. We're to be content because we're trusting and obeying in the will of the Father. They're walking the walk and talking the talk of the truth. In verse 5, And now I beseech thee, lady, not as though I wrote a new commandment unto thee, but that which we have from the beginning, that we love one another. As John is saying, it is important for us to love one another. You know, we all, we all here in this room have experienced God's love when we were saved. 
we need to share that love to others. John says this is not a new ideal. This is not something he's just come up with. He said this, this is a command to love. And it, and it started from the beginning. Now, John, he, he had been with Jesus for three years. Jesus taught them many lessons, many lessons of truth and love. So John says, this is nothing, this ain't something new. It's a commandment of the Lord that we love one another. You know, we need to remember how God showed his love to us when he gave us his son to die on the cross to save us from our sins. John is asking the church, he's asking the church to remember Christ's atoning death and their lives should reflect God's love to others. In verse 6, And this is love that we walk after His commandment. This is the commandment that as we have heard from the beginning, ye should walk in it. Walking is having a full devotion to the Lord's commandment. John is telling the church to look. Look, and if you see some people that have a need, then reach out, reach out to them in love. And fill those needs the best way that you, we can. But always, always rely on God for the help. You know, his commandment in this verse is referring to Jesus' commands. One of Jesus' commands was, we're to, love, we're to love God with all of our heart, our soul, and mind, and to love our neighbors as ourselves. We all know that verse. Another command that he gave the church was the Great Commission. This commission was not just to try your best, or if you can, do it. It was a command to the church by Jesus. It was, our, it was a mission for the church. You know, we're to spread the, God's truth and God's word. Spread the good news of the gospel. Show God's love to everyone that we can. John says, this is the commandment that is ye have heard from the beginning. From Genesis all the way through Revelations, we see the love of God. So you could, you could call the Bible a love story. And if you wanted to sum the Bible up in one word, it would be love. So at the end of verse 6, John says, ye should, ye should walk in it. Our daily lives should, be, should show the love of God. And we should do it without expecting love in return. And we should do it without any worldly motives. In verse 7, For many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus has come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. So John is saying the church is under a threat and we need to be aware of it. He said there are many deceivers, many out in the world. Deceivers means people who who will lead others astray from believing the truths of God's Word. You know, they will teach false teachings and do their best to get people, just get them away, just wander away just a little bit from what the Bible teaches. These false teachers, they're good at it. They're deceivers. You know, back in John's day, the deceivers was teaching that Jesus... He didn't actually come in the flesh. 
That's what they were trying to teach and, and convince people. They were saying he was spirit. He was spirit the whole time. And what they were doing, they were denying Jesus' humanity. They talked a good talk. And they confused a lot of young believers. The deceivers was telling them to confess, to confess not that Jesus uh, came, came in the flesh. Confess here means to agree with or co to come to the same conclusion as they, these false teachers, was coming to. John calls them, the, uh, uh, these deceivers, the Antichrist. This is anyone that deceives others about the truth of God's Word. You know, what they were doing, these Antichrists, they, they were just aligning themselves with Satan. And they're doing Satan's work. You know, I saw on TV uh, last, last week, I think it was, a guy that he, he was an atheist, and he looked the part. Wore black clothes, had piercings on his face and tattoos all over himself. Looked like someone that you don't want coming to your front door. But all Antichrist, they don't have to look like that. They can be clean cut and they can be good looking. John tells us that we need, you know, we may face, but we may be faced with a threat. And we need to be aware of it. Now, in the latter days, a person will arise as the Antichrist. He's going to, he's going to deceive many. And the people that were not saved, left behind, they need to also be aware of what the Antichrist is up to. In verse 8, look to yourselves that we lose not those things which we have wrought, but that we received a full reward. You know, John had taught the believers, along with, along with other teachers, about the truths of Christ and God's love. You know, he wanted them to be alert of the false teachers so that they could reject them but also help others reject these false teachings. He said to stand up. You know, we're to stand up for God's truths. And then he assured them that God would give them a full reward for their faithfulness to him. In our last verse, Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. So John tells them to abide in Christ's teachings and to follow it because it is true. We should, we should reject anything, I mean anything that's outside biblical truth. If someone says, and I have heard this many times, God loves sinners and he won't send them to hell because he loves them. I've heard that many times. That is half truth. Yes, God loves sinners. Thank God he loved me. But that is a half truth and we should reject it. Deceivers will use the Word of God to de try to deceive anyone. We need to be aware of it. You know, John says that anyone that does not accept the doctrine of Jesus, then that person does not have God. You know, the way that we live our lives tells if we're living for Christ. We're set apart from the world. We're blessed, just think about it, we're blessed with God's mercy and His amazing grace. 
Now, we need to love. We need to love one another more and more and more. Because when we walk, when we walk with Christ, we walk in truth and love. We're set apart by God for God. Anyway, that's all I have this morning. Anybody have uh, anything they'd like to add to this? No, no, thank you. Well, thank you everybody for your attention. 276. 276. Let's stand together and sing. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. It's good to be in the Lord's house, isn't it? Amen. And we started out right this morning. We sang Trust and Obey. And that's part of my sermon, or in my sermon. And uh, Brother Gary announced that. I said, Praise the Lord. And what a fellowship. What a glory divine. Amen. And there's nothing like in all the world of leaning on His everlasting arms, is there? Amen. So we welcome you to Bethany. It's certainly good to see you. And we want to have a, maybe some prayer requests, uh, something on your heart to be prayed about. Uh, maybe something to mention this morning. Prayer, again, we welcome you to the service. We had 23 in our Sunday school. And we're excited about what the Lord has for us this morning. And uh, always need your prayers. And we're praying for Children's Church. And Brian will be coming here shortly. And uh, look forward to that. And the memory verse, the memory verse, give us that, Petey, and I'll, uh, we'll think about that this morning. Uh, the memory verse is Psalm 73, verse 28. And uh, sometimes in studying the message, I uh, maybe within the, the verses that I'm going to use in the sermon, uh, there'll be a memory verse, or maybe outside of that. But uh, the Lord gave me this memory verse a little before 5 o'clock this morning. <laughs> Uh, I was reading Psalms chapter 73. And by the way, we hadn't had an assignment in a little while. That's the assignment this week. Read Psalm 73. And, uh, but a little before five, 
I read that and I got to the last verse and it uh, seemed like uh, that come to my mind. That's the memory verse. Uh, but it's good for me to draw near to God. That's good for anyone, isn't it? And I'll have my trust in the Lord God that I may declare all thy works. It's good for me and it's good for everybody to draw near to God. And there's a good verse that parallels with that in the book of James, I believe, ain't Pity, where it said, if you draw nigh to God, then uh, he'll draw nigh to you. So that's a blessing, isn't it? Uh, there it is. Draw nigh to God, and he'll draw nigh to you. And cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double mind. Draw nigh to God, and he'll draw nigh to you. Is that a blessing? Amen. So it's good to be here. We're excited about what the Lord has. Uh, for uh, as we can continue the service, and Brian, you come for Children's Church. Getting along. Good. Emily, come on. We'll wait on you if you want to go. It's up to you. Okay. All right. It's good to be in God's house today, is it not? Yes, it is. I want to tell you a little tale here, right? In with, and then we're going into some scripture. But there was once a, a sculptor, old sculptor, but he had, was tasked with the job of putting the capital on a post. You know what that is? Capital is that thing that goes up there between the roof and the top of that column. Usually it's you know, ordained with pictures or whatever it might be. But his job was to, to chisel that piece of probably limestone with some pretty stuff on it. And he's just sitting there, and he's whittling on it and beating. You ever beat on a rock, any of you? I beat on rocks, try to get them out of the ground. I don't worry about what they look like. You know what I'm saying? It's hard work, though. And I can imagine chiseling that rock probably is not any easier, but they're trying to make it look like something, like maybe Michael's beautiful face, some of the thing. I mean, it'd be tough, wouldn't it, to get that? Yeah, it'd be tough to get that on that block of limestone, wouldn't it? But he's working on that thing, and he's beating that thing and that rock, and he's working on it because he's trying to get the little intricate details within that picture. You know what I'm saying? I mean, he's trying to do it hard, it's hard work. And the politician walks by. Politician, you gotta love him, don't you? And he looks at it. He says, Why are you spending so much time on the details of that block? It's going 50 foot up in there. There ain't no human eyes gonna see that details in that block. That old sculptor took his hammer and his chisel, he laid them down, and he looked right at that politician. He said, No, but God will see. God will see. Now listen, I love to work. I do. I love to work. I know some people don't. I love to work. I mean, I love to have something to do and something going on. But in everything that we do, we need to put our hand to it, as in that knowing God's got His eye on it. We need to try, in the, you know, please Him. Let's do it right. Why don't we do things a certain way, Michael? I mean, is it because we just want somebody to brag on us? Or is it because we know that God Almighty is looking over what we're doing each and every day? We can glorify Him in everything we do. Amen. Our work can glorify Him, can it not? Yeah. It's nothing that, that your boss man look at you and say, well, he does a good job. Now, I don't do a good job, but God, I want to please my, my Savior. And I want to do what's right by Him. But guess what? He sees that in the work I do. Now, in the book of Peter, 1 Peter this morning, in chapter number 3 and verse 10, the Bible says, For he that will love life and see good days, let him refrain from his tongue from evil, and his lips that speak no guile. Let me read that again. And his lips that they speak no guile. Let him eschew evil and do good. Let him seek peace and ensue it. For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open into their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. Peter decided when he went to write this down in the, the book here, he took... David's words from the book of Psalms in 34, in verse, I think it was 15 through 22, exactly. And he reworked them a little bit here, but that's what he was talking about, was that psalm that David said. And I want you to understand this morning that there, there's, Peter, listen to that. He said, for he, will, he that will love life and see good days. Michael, we like to have good days, don't we? Amen. It's nothing like getting outside and having a good day. A great day in the Lord. I heard several this morning coming in. It's a beautiful day this morning. And it is. 
But it's a good day in the Lord. Amen. And life in, in heaven and, and uh, to see good days and the, the life, to love life. We love life, don't we? I don't know anybody that don't love life. But sometimes times are hard. And life's hard. And we don't have such good days. But he said to take the tongue that it speak no evil. Refrain it from speaking evil. That little thing right there wagging in our mouth will get us in some kind of trouble. How many times has something went out like this? You'd like, oh, I wish I could bring that back in. But we can't. Can't. You say it, it's out there. But to control what that tongue and the lips that speak no guile and the skew to run to, to, I mean to choose to run from evil is what I'm trying to say. Got to make a choice. We have to make a choice. It's easy to get herself in trouble, ain't it? Sure is. But to refrain, to, to absolutely decide we're going to run from evil, we're going to know Listen, getting into it, seek peace. We like peace. I love peace. But to seek peace in the Lord. And why do we do this? It's because for the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous. We need to be right. We need to do the best we can in our abilities through the help of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ to do the right things each and every day. Because His eyes are on the righteous. He says the ears are open to our prayers. Oh, let that sink in. Our Heavenly Father this morning has His ears open to this wagon tongue that I can speak to Him this morning. I'm putting those things in His hands I can't do, which is a whole lot of things. But His ears are open to our prayers. He said, but the face is against them that do evil. You want to go against God? I don't see he's ever worked out for anybody. He says his face is against the evil. I'm going to read you a couple more verses right quick, and I'm going to finish up. And everybody said, yay. Right? In the book of 1 John this morning, chapter number 3, the Bible says, Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God's, sons of God, excuse me. Therefore, the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it, that it doth yet not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Pete told me a little thing yesterday. He said, you might use it sometime. He's talking about the eye. And we, we think, well, we see with our eyes, don't we? Well, that's true, but it's not true because the eyes are simply a vessel to carry that light through them to the back of your brain so we see that image. So in truth, they're just a vessel. Today, I'm telling you, without light, you can't see. When you're in the dark, you can't see. And when you're in sin, you can't see. But the light of Jesus Christ can light up the spiritual eyes of your soul and you realize who He is. Amen. And without Him to light that up in your life, you'll never know who He is. But God sees us because He is that light. He sees us for who we are. He knows my very motive. For what I'm sitting here right now for. He knows your motivation for being sitting on that uh, bench today. He knows that motivation. He sees us. Nothing we put on out here is going to cover his eyes to the point he can't see what's in here. Amen. And I hope this morning and pray this morning that we have Christ sitting right here. And with his eyes, he sees that. Because his eyes are on the righteous this morning. His eyes are on the righteous. I think you're ready. You're done, right? Is that it? Is that enough? Y'all are very attentive, guys. Really and truly, you're very attentive this morning. And I so 
love to see each and one of you here. I really, really do. Got prayer requests? Amen. Bible school. Thank you, Liam. I appreciate that, buddy. Preacher? Let's pray for a preacher today. He's carrying some stuff this morning. Let's have God help him this morning Amen. to preach the Word of God. And Gary, I want to say one thing to you too this morning. Gary said something Sunday school this morning. He said, Christians are not like this world. That's a very true statement, guys. Amen. We're not very popular in this world today. But you know what? Whose eyes are upon us? Whose? The Lord's eyes are upon us. So let's stand in the might of Jesus Christ this morning. You ready to pray? All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. Lord, thank you, Father, for this day. And God, what a blessing and encouragement it is to be in the house of God this morning. And I pray, Father, in the name of Jesus, God, would you light, Lord, that soul that don't know you, Father, this morning. Would you light, God, give them the light of Jesus Christ. Lord, help them to be saved, God, whether it be here, whether it be another church across this land, God, across this world. People need Jesus, Lord. And Father, I thank you, God, that your eyes are upon me each and every day. God, you lead me. Father, at this very moment, your ears are attentive to my prayers. And God, that humbles me. God, who am I? What am I to be able to speak to you this morning? But I thank you for your son, Jesus. And through his precious blood, Lord, I have a way, Lord, to speak, Lord. Come to the very throne of grace this morning. I thank you, Lord. And I praise you. I praise you for these young people. God, help them. God, encourage them. God, help us as parents and teachers and friends to give them that they stand in need of to come to saving grace, knowledge of Jesus Christ, God. I pray for our pastor, Lord, to help him this morning, help him preach the word of God in a way to be pleasing to you and Lord, to be helped us. And we pray for children's church and we do pray for Bible school. And we're going to ask these things in the name of Jesus we pray and amen. Let's all sing together hymn number 283.
Our text verse this morning is Psalms 119 and verse uh, 133. And trust the Lord to help us. I was thinking as we're singing that song and uh, reading the words, and uh, I kind of like these monitors myself, don't you? Uh, I think it's been a blessing. I appreciate the leadership here in making the decision. And uh, we've, got a, we've got a real uh, sophisticated uh, technical system here for a small country church, amen? amen. And Petey tells me this is what, what, what he's back there and I guess these buttons, these technicians they ain't even got into yet. They's, this thing will do a lot more than it's doing now, but uh, I, I appreciate it. But reading those words, and I thought about it, it'd be good just to get a songbook sometime or another at home and open it up and find that song and just read those words, amen? And what a blessing. It's talking about uh, he can bear something, uh, bears a part that none can bear below. And that's true, isn't it, of Jesus. He can, uh, he can come and, uh, and, and be to us what nobody else can be. And uh, that's a blessing, isn't it? I'm trying to preach this morning on steps in thy word in Psalms 119 and verse 133. And trust the Lord to help us. Uh, certainly it's good to be in the Lord's house, isn't it? And I'm rejoicing about uh, the privilege of being in the Lord's house. And appreciate you praying for me. The Lord will help me in uh, trying to bring the message this morning. And uh, it's just the uh, Lord certainly is good. And I appreciate I might mention this. You know, uh, and I don't know uh, every situation, but uh, I know I've spoken to someone this morning and there's others perhaps. And, you know, sometimes we're not physically as we'd like to be. But uh, I appreciate you coming. And, you know, if we just come all the time by according to our feelings, there are times we cannot come. And I understand that. And uh, we've got situations of that uh, that uh, people, they'd love to be here. They can't, but then there's other times we kind of press on a little bit and we're not always, we're not hitting on every cylinder, are we? And uh, I told a little thing about uh, Brian about a Ford and he might share that with you and hit, cut him deep. I'm hoping he's, and I hope the sermon will help you, man. man but, but I'm going to say this about Brian Eastep. You know, my daddy had a saying, and I'm going to do that this morning, my daddy used to have a saying, he's talking about flowers, people bringing flowers. And, uh, and we do that out of respect, and, and uh, I, I do that myself. We send flowers to people that love ones and others, and whenever a person passes. But my dad had this saying, you may have heard that, and he said, I'd like to get my flowers while I'm living where I can smell them, you know, and there's some truth to that. But uh, so we passed out some flowers. But I was thinking about Brian. My dad would have loved you dearly. And I, I guarantee he'd say, I tell you what, that Brian Eastep, he's all right. But he's talking about working, loving to work. My dad loved to work. I mean, he loved to work. But I was delivering oil one day to Stephen Call. He used to work with Brian, and he said, that Brian Eastep's the hardest working person I ever met. <laughs> That's a good compliment, isn't it? Well, we got thousands of people in this country that couldn't be said of, and we. <laughs> I pray it'd be the reverse on some of our uh, generation that we're raising. You know, they don't want to do nothing. You know, they they think work's bad, but uh, it is an honorable thing, isn't it? So it's good to be in the Lord's house. Psalm one nineteen, verse one thirty three, and uh, in this psalm, and of course, Psalm one nineteen is all about the Word of God. Uh, but in this psalm, the psalmist said, Order my steps in thy word, and let my iniquity, uh, let not my iniquity have dominion over me. Our Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, thank you uh, for salvation through the Lord Jesus, for saving me. And I pray for a person on my heart this morning. And I'm, I'm thinking about him as I'm standing here to try to deliver a message, and I pray for their salvation. Uh, you'd save this person for Christ's sake. I pray you would, and I pray there's many others. And uh, we've got a lost world out there that needs a Savior. I pray you'd help me in the message going forth and that the Word of God would be what we need uh, for our heart's needs. May it touch hearts, touch my heart, afresh and anew, even though I've studied and 
It has spoken to me already. May it, may it be real again. I pray the breath from heaven, sweet Holy Spirit of God, would move through and, and uh, we, we would, would, would sense and uh, uh, thank God for your presence this morning. Help us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to look, I'm thinking this morning on steps and I just got on that uh, thought in my mind and I was thinking about this, uh, David said uh, whenever uh, Saul was in pursuit of him one time in the book of Samuel and uh, he, said, he made a statement that uh, I've tried to preach a message on that. Other preachers have too. And he made a very profound statement and he said there is uh, David uh, swam over and he said and he said thy father certainly knoweth that I have found grace in thine eyes. He's talking to Jonathan. And he saith, let not Jonathan know this, lest he be grieved. But truly as the Lord liveth and as my soul liveth, uh, there is but a step between me and death. Just one step between me and death. And David felt that way and was experiencing that in the pursuit of Saul after to take his life. And he said, there's just one step between me and death. And I was thinking that'd be good for everybody to reckon on uh, once in a while, wouldn't you think? Uh, to realize that there is just but one step between us and death. And with that being said, I was thinking about, and Peter, I believe on the back, if you've got all that, I'm going to use that for my introduction. I think I'll just use it all at one time, uh, the, some of the things there on the back. And uh, about uh, the, the Word of God. Have we got that first? Uh, the Word is more than the Word. And I, I'll use all that for, for an introduction. Uh, and we're talking about uh, our steps in the Word of God. Uh, the Word of God is more than a word that has been spoken, but praise God, His is a word that is speaking. Amen. A word that is speaking. We experienced that in the opening this morning. We experienced that in the Sunday school as the teacher read and expounded on and taught us the verses as he's reading that we're in children's church as Brian gives the Word of God. Uh, the Word of God is not just the Word that has been spoken, but praise God, it is a Word that is speaking, and it's speaking already to my heart this morning in the opening the Word of God given in the class this morning in the children's church. I trust in the message, the Word of God is speaking, amen. It's alive. And then something else, I thought this is, I've got several things in my introduction and walk with the Lord in the light of His Word. And that song, that's the thing, Brother Gary, when you announce trust and obey. And the song, I read the song history of that this week. It is, it, I can't remember it distinctly all the details, but as I'm remembering, there was a service that was taking place, and there was a young, young person who had given testimony. And this young person said this, and said, all I know to do is just to trust and obey. And that being said, there was, and I can't remember who wrote the song, but the person that wrote the song was there and heard that testimony, and it just hit them like that, and they went pretty shortly and began to write the song, Trust and Obey. And we walk in, while we walk in the, in the, with the Lord and the light of His Word, and what a glory, praise God, what a glory... He shares on the way, amen, when we're walking with the Lord in the light of His Word. And then as we continue on, this is my introduction. My introduction is going to be longer than the sermon in case some of y'all get nervous. Uh, God gives orders and we supply the obedience, amen. God gives the orders and we supply the obedience. And one of my verses in the sermon is, and the, the Bible said that a good man's steps is ordered by the Lord. But uh, I was reading something, and I said, I'm going to write that down. Uh, God will not order our steps if we had no intention of doing what he says. That makes sense, don't it? And the Lord knows our hearts, don't it? So the marching orders he would give to us, and maybe it works on both ends. The good man's steps is ordered by the Lord, but that good man's got to be willing and have a desire to follow what God tells him, amen? So it all works together. And then we're going down, uh, uh, God gives the order and God will not supply the steps. Uh, and then a person whose steps are ordered by the Lord, praise God, 
uh, will be led in the paths of victory. I believe that, don't you? When we're following the steps that he has for us, it'll be in paths of victory. Praise God. I'm thinking this morning, my first point is one step, just one step, and how significant and how important just one very uh, step can be. Uh, it's a very small act, but it can have such far-reaching consequences. And all of us that have uh, children and then grandchildren, and boy, the grandchildren are grand, aren't they? And uh, my little baby is getting married. I can hardly stand it. And me and Nanny, we're, she is about to break down in tears. And, and so we just had to quit talking about it for a little while. But it's, Lord willing, it's going to happen. Uh, but uh, just one little step. But the grandkids, the kids, the grandkids, you remember all of us as parents and grandparents and how exciting that was. You know, we have them, we did, and the parents, grandparents do that. You know, you sit over here, and the other sits over here, and come to mama, come to grandpa, and all that. And that kid making that first step, that's a thrill of life, ain't it? As a parent and a grandparent, that first step. And you know, they get up, you know, get bounced on their feet, and you know, they make that first step. They may make the first step for the first time and just fall right then. They've just made one step. But one step is significant, isn't it? And one step, as I said, can cause consequences many times. Just the wrong step. Our steps are important, aren't they? You know, we used to sing a little song when I was growing up in Sunday school as a kid. And we'd say, be careful little eyes what you see. And be careful little hands what you handle. And be careful little feet where you go. And what a, what a message that was to us just in simple kids' terms, be careful, little feet, where you go. And there's been many of a step that's been made that's, that's made a lifetime of regret because of just the wrong steps in life. And I want to talk this morning. I'm thinking about steps, and I've got some good things in this message, I feel like, and I've got some big, powerful points if I can get to them, amen, and I trust the Lord. I want to remember, after preaching sometimes, I'm going down the road rehearsing in my mind, and I said, I forgot my big points. So some of the sermons that you hear, you don't even really get them good ones, you know. I forget them. So maybe I'll remember the good ones, forget some that's not too significant this morning. We're thinking about steps. In my little sermon this morning, my outline, one step, and then the steps of faith. In the book of Romans, chapter 4, I believe in verse 12, is that the verse that talks about steps of faith? Steps of faith. And I'll think about that initially this morning. Uh, and the father of circumcision to them who are the circumcision only, but also uh, walk in the steps of faith of our father Abraham uh, when he being yet uncircumcised. It's the, the, the context of that and in the, in the, the verse itself talking about uncircumcision. And Abraham walked in faith before circumcision. And that verse is telling us that. But in the steps of faith, using Abraham as an example, and he is an example. In the book of Romans, again, it said about Abraham, and the same thing applies to you and I, that he believed God, and it was accounted unto him for righteousness. My first thought this morning is salvation, walking in the steps of faith, believing on the Lord Jesus Christ, trusting him as our own personal Savior. Now, and later in the sermon, I want to talk about, in the book of First Peter, about the steps of Jesus. I, talked, I asked a man one time on the job there, are you saved? And he said, I'm following the teachings of Jesus. Well, that don't fit. Anybody that's lost, you cannot follow the teachings of Jesus. In, in the book of 1 Peter, where we're going to look a little later about the footsteps of Jesus, the context there, he's talking to believers. And we're walking in the steps of Jesus. That's for believers but somebody that's not saved, they're not following the teachings of Jesus. What they need and every lost sinner needs is a Savior. And they walk in the steps of faith and believing in the Lord Jesus Christ. They need to believe in Him, follow their heart. That's walking in the steps of faith. And then not only that, but we see the order by the Lord, uh, our steps are. And that means they're secure and uh, established. 
But then not only the steps, in the book of Psalms, chapter 73, and that's where the memory verse is, the last verse, but in that psalm, and that's the assignment is read Psalms 73. But uh, the, the David said in that psalm that my feet had well nigh slipped. Your feet slip. I guess most of us have done that and slipping uh, with our feet. Sometimes if all of a sudden, and maybe you've fallen, maybe you've broken something, and then we don't know how in the world that happened. And then there's other times whenever our feet slip. I don't know if any of y'all ever done that or not, but you start falling, and you're trying to balance, and you, you fall three times before you ever hit the ground. Anybody ever done that besides me? And you know... <laughs> I'll probably be doing... You know, you go to the doctor and they want to know, uh, have you fallen lately? That's what they asked us old people. And then they do, they're doing this to us too, us old people. We go to the doctor and they say, I'm going to give you three words. And I want you to remember these three words. And then later on, they'll ask you what the three words are. So Beverly, her therapist come, released her from... Therapy, and we praise the Lord. That's a milestone and uh, quite an accomplishment. But I didn't know they'd do that just on, but he said, I'm going to give you three words. And it was blue, and uh, I can't remember her three words. I'll just make up one. <laughs> but one of them was blue, and the last one was bed, and I can't remember the one in the middle. I'll just say a goat or whatever it was, but she got them all right. So after he had left Beverly, she was telling me, she said, I'm going to give you three words. <laughs> and uh, said, you know, later on I'm going to ask you. So she said, your three words are Roger, Roger, and Roger. <laughs> I got it. Can you imagine my own wife doing me like uh, But my feet, Almost gone in my steps. My steps had well nigh slipped. Now I'll talk just a little bit about Psalm 73 and what David was dealing with here in Psalm 73. And I'd say most of us have had some struggles with that and we're trying to put things together of what's happening to us and we look at what's happening to somebody else. And the psalmist is struggling with that and he's much like you and I. And he said, my feet, my steps had well nigh slipped. And the context of that, and that's our assignment, you read that. And what he's talking about in Psalm 73, the psalmist goes on and said, I was envious of the foolish. I became envious of the foolish. And he goes on and begins to, to, uh, to identify, I think, who he was having reference to, the foolish. But he said that he saw the thing he was struggling with was the prosperity of the wicked. And he said the wicked, you know, they were, do, they, they were prospering and, and, you know, things was going good for them. They was just, you know, it, 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 why is that happening? You would think that things is gonna, should be going in a different direction. And then the psalmist even said this about himself. He said, I have cleansed my heart in vain. Here I am being chastened and afflicted and doing right. And here's the wicked that are prospering. Something wrong with this picture. And he said it, it, it was too painful for me. He was having a struggle with that. But he goes on and said, but I went into the sanctuary of God and I began to understand because I understood what their end was going to be. Only the heaven that they know is right here. But he said, my feet had almost slipped. Boy, I've slipped a lot of times. And you, you say, what are you having reference to about the slipping? We begin thinking, and, and, we, and, and the slipping that I've slipped many times is I begin to look at things from a human perspective. But God's wanting me to see it from His perspective. And then whenever I begin to see it from His perspective, praise God, the puzzle begins to fit together. And it makes sense. And otherwise, if we just think from a human perspective, it won't never make sense. My sermon outline. Stepping, my feet just slip. And then he said, steps in thy word. 
And then the steps of Jesus. I've already mentioned that. Give me those verses, Peter, if you will, of First Peter. I, I want to give us those verses. He said, what glory is it if after you're buffeted for your faults that you take it patiently? I mean, you know, we're guilty. We get buffeted for it. But he said, when you do well, you suffer for it and take it patiently. That is acceptable with God. You know, it's not so difficult if we know we're guilty, we're being buffeted for our faults, and we say, well, and then we kind of conclude, if we'll be honest, say, well, I deserved it. But then when we're doing well, and we suffer for it, if we take it patiently, then God accepts that. And he goes on, and he talks about the next verse, for even here and too, where you call because Christ has suffered for us and He's lifted an example for us that we should follow in His steps. Whenever you suffer for doing well, if you take it patiently, then you're following in the steps of Jesus the example He left for us. And let me add this this morning, that Jesus is the greatest example in any area of our life and anything we could think about this morning. But a lost sinner needs salvation, needs a Savior, and then we want to desire and to follow in His steps. Then I thought about, and I'm about through this morning, but I'm thinking about steps. And Brian mentioned something here in Children's Church, and it was like a dagger in my heart. And it's true in life. And he's talking about words that goes out, and you wish you could grab them, take them back. And then maybe situations where you wished you'd have said some words that you maybe should have said that you didn't say. You know, there's more to that. I got to thinking about, you know, we've, we've got to, and people get in that mindset, they, they reduce their Christianity to just coming to church on Sunday. That's a shame and a disgrace, ain't it? And I just about venture to say this morning that if you reduce it to that and you ain't got no more than that, I don't know what you've got this morning. But I'll tell you what, Christianity and being saved, He can wake us up and speak to us any time during the week, and He does that a lot of times in, in, the, in the things of life that we, uh, we not only commit sin, commit sin, but we've got sins of omission. And there's one that's troubling me this morning that I experienced this very week, a sin of omission, something that I, I really should have done and should have said, but I wasn't in the right place to say it. You know, you say, what was the matter? My steps wasn't where they ought to be been with God. My fellowship, my nearness, and our memory verse this morning is that I need to draw near to God. And the nearer we are to God, the more likely we're going to not have so many sins of omission. We're going to be in the place that we ought to be where we'll be doing what we ought to do at the time we ought to do it, amen. <laughs> and then we won't be grieved over it later on. Now that's the message to me and somebody's going to wonder, I wonder what in the world that the preacher did not do or that he did. Well, it ain't too drastic. I didn't get drunk or nothing. <laughs> Don't get too excited. But you know, I was thinking about, we look at some people say, and we say, boy, a terrible thing they've done. But whenever we begin to analyze ourselves. And just omitting something. You say you believe people are giving account of things that we should have done that we didn't do as much as I believe I'm standing here. And it's not altogether the things that we do. Then I thought about in the Bible example, steps to run. And I thought about Lot. Boy, if he could have backed up in life and, and not saw those well-watered plains and pitched his tent towards Solomon, would he not been a lot better off? And he had to take the first step, didn't he, in that direction, and he sure did do it. It'd been good if he could have just been alerted and been conscious of what was going on and the decision that was being made, and he wasn't never made that first step. But it ended up in a life of ruin. And we know the story, and we tell about that about Lot and all the tragic things that happened as, as things progressed during the famine, the incest, and all the other terrible things that Lot, he, he, went, he, he made some wrong steps. And then I thought about the steps of returning. Praise God, the prodigal son. You know, I'm up here thinking as we're singing, 
And I mentioned about a, just a personal thing that happened this, just this very week to me. And I thought about a little illustration that I've used before about the little boy that was playing and he fell down in the mud puddle. And his mama, you know, his mama there he was, he fell down in the mud puddle and his mama came and she put her hands on her hip. I tell you, when a mama puts her hands on the hip, you look out, it's bad from there on out. I don't know what that is, but that's not a good sign. And she looked at him and said, now what are you going to do? And the little boy said, I'm going to get up. You say, what can you do, preacher? Praise God, I'm glad for a second chance, a third chance, and keeping on out there, aren't you? We can get a, the prodigal sons down in the hog pen. And he said, I'm, I'm going to rise. And I'm going to the Father. I'm glad, thank God, that God gives the opportunity and the privilege and that you and I can make steps of returning. We sing the song sometimes, Lord, I've wandered far away from home. But now, now I'm coming home. And that prodigal, you say, what happened, preacher? Well, the truth of the matter is, whenever he, in his own mind, his heart, and he'd, he'd got down there and the situation had got what it was and he made the decision, said, I'm going to rise and go to my father's house. Praise God, he had to make that first step toward the father's house. But that story just gets better and better as it unfolds. The father saw him. You said, did the father make one of them, just them first steps you're talking about, preacher? No. That old man took off running. He was making some fast steps. And he got a hold of that boy and just fell on him. And they fell in each other's arms and just wept and cried and loved each other. Boy, I'm glad we've got a heavenly father like that. You said, preacher, I want to be honest this morning. I've made some steps in the wrong direction. Praise God. You know, you get to intersections, sometimes different places says, no U-turns. No U-turns. But I'm glad God ain't got none of them posted nowhere that I know of. If we're going in the wrong direction, we can turn around, thank God, and make a U-turn and make our steps in the other direction. I'm glad, thank God, for the steps of returning. Maybe some need some returning this morning. It'd be good. And the truth of the matter is, you'll never have the, the settled peace in your heart till you turn around, if you need to turn around and head in the other direction. And you know, it's, this is the truth of the matter. That Young man down there in the hog pen, whenever he in his mind said, I'm going to rise, praise God, you make that first step. We say that in preaching, in services. We'll say sometimes, if there's somebody not saved, and we'll say this, and I believe it's true, and we'll say to somebody that needs to get saved, and they say, you make that first step, and God will take over, won't He? He makes other steps. If there's something that's got away from you, you've been in the wrong steps and you need to turn around, praise God, you, you in your heart before God, our memory verse, well, I need to draw nigh to God, you make that first step, and I'll assure you, I believe that those other steps is going to be so much easier and you're going to get to where you need to be with God. God's good, ain't He? Hallelujah. I've asked the Lord to help me and I want the Holy Spirit of God to Move and sweep through, don't you? I'm listening at a sermon coming up the road. I listen at preaching. If you're going to preach, you've got to be preached to. I found that out. Somebody said, these people that write books, writers, you know what they do? They read. A writer, somebody that writes books, is a reader. So we preach too. I'm coming up the road. Guy's preaching. And he's preaching, oh, we need to clean the filters. Clean the filters. I kind of neglected my furnace filter. I might get Beverly to change it next week. Uh, now that I think about it. But you know what that filter does? I don't, I'm not a mechanic, don't understand mechanical things. And all I understand if you turn the switch and it starts, then praise God. 
You know one of two things. You don't know what make a model it is. But anyway, if it starts, I don't care what it is. Amen. If it goes, you push the pedal, we go. But you know that filter, if I understand it, and we've got filters, oil filters, you've got air cleaner filters on the automobiles and all that. They filter out the stuff that ain't supposed to be there. But if the filter gets stopped up, the air can't go through it. I neglected it one time, and whenever I pulled the filter out, it come out in sections. <laughs> it ain't supposed to do that. It, it ain't supposed to tire up when you pull it out. It ain't supposed to be that heavy loaded. You know, it done, it wasn't cutting clean nothing, you know. But I will say this morning, I want to change the filter in my life. I want to keep it clean. You say, why? Where that sweet Holy Spirit of God, that wind from heaven has got a free course and can just run through, Amen. Lord, help us this morning. Let's stand and pray. And well, it's good to be in the Lord's house. Usually I'd just pray, but while our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed, and maybe I could pray for you. Just between you and the Lord, I mean, if you feel that or sense that, then maybe there's some steps and Maybe you need to turn around some steps or maybe whatever it is, some need. Uplifted hand, I'll pray for you. I'll pray for you this morning. I appreciate that. Appreciate that. Our Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, thank you for hands lifted. And Lord, the steps that we've either made or we've failed to make, Lord, I pray you'd help us. Thank you, Lord, there is a returning. And we can turn around and head in the right direction. And the things that we've left undone, we can ask you to help us that in the future that we'll be able to do the things and say the things we ought to do. And may you help us. Lord, we can't do it within our own self. The, fa- the flesh will fail us. It's failed me so many times. But thank God the Spirit indeed is willing, even though the flesh is weak. May you help us, we pray this morning, and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. been good to be in the Lord's house, has it not? Amen. Amen. I feel good about it. Amen. And preacher Amor, you did pretty good considering the shape you're in. God's good, ain't he? You need to pray for me. Uh, later this evening, uh, the way the thing's going, my little baby sweet girl that's 19, that I treat like she's just a kid yet. (laughs) And she put a sign on my refrigerator and signed her name to it and said, you're the greatest papa in all war. That's me. (laughs) But 
you pray for me. This evening, a little later, I'm going to pronounce her <laughs> and her fiancé, husband and wife. And I hope that the people that's there is not going to look and then I'm going to break down and they're going to say, what's the matter with that old man? <laughs> I hope that don't help, baby. God's good, ain't he? And you pray for them. Starting out a new life, amen. 54 years, I made it 54 years. I tell people, I have people ask me, I've had somebody this week said, how long have you been married? I said, 54 years. And I said, we've decided just to try to tough it out. <laughs> God's good, eh? <laughs> amen. Preacher Lord, would you dismiss it?